change to the agenda, which is that we will not be going into executive session to discuss pending litigation. Executive session will only be to discuss strategy for collective bargaining because open session would have a detrimental effect on the process.
So again, um, these things will sort of flush out over time, and you know we're just sort of in the process of starting this. But those are sort of some of the concerns. Uh, on the plus side, Mike's not here, but I'll toss in some plus side. Uh, the end of the year is coming. It's been a very, very busy few weeks. With field trips are out this week. It's very quiet around the school. It feels like no one's here. The seniors have have left us. Um, Quite noisily, they have left us, and quite quietly, they leave us. Um, and um, so that, that's nice to have the kids on, on field trips. I, I keep getting pictures back from the history teachers who are in Washington, D.C. with the sophomores right now. Uh, looks like they're having a good time. Uh, the sixth grade was out this week. The 11th grade is out tomorrow uh, in Boston. I think the eighth grade is out this week as well on a field trip. So I know a lot of people have been asking for field trips, so it's, it's nice to see them and nice to sort of it's always nice at the end of the year to look back and say goodbye to our seniors and have a nice senior breakfast and things like that. So that was nice. Great. Thank you, Arthur. Any questions? Okay. Liz? Um, actually, just tacking along uh, to what Jessica was saying, um, I think that there is also concern on the parent side about class sizes for next year and um, what that is going to look like. So uh, that is something that I've heard from uh, a handful of parents. Uh, I will say in general, I think that um, uh, end of the year fatigue has set in, so there's not a lot else um, going on. I think, to Jessica's point, it's there's a lot going on within the school with activities and, and field trips and, and all that. So I think that in graduation coming up, so I think that people are, are busy with all of those types of things, and uh, there is definitely uh, not not a lot else to report at this point. I, I would say the teachers are not feeling fatigued at all. We do go at least another four times. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> How are you hearing concerns about class sizes? Who is raising? Just How in general, it's not here. It's, parent, it's from parents that are concerned about the size of their classes based on what their students have this year. and Based on this year. Yeah, based on this year and what it's going to look like for next year. So um, is, the, you know, is it going to improve? Are the class sizes going to go down or are they going to go up? I mean, just in, in general, what, in what area is it going to trend? That's going to be administered in the first two days of June. So it's been going well. I think there's been a lot of cooperation and help uh, between the various teachers and administrators and the folks that are uh, working to make that happen. It's rather, it's a lot of work and planning and it can be rather complex to do, especially considering that we have some challenges space-wise here. So it's a particularly uh, challenging sort of jigsaw puzzle that we have to figure out. I think the, People that are doing it have done a great job. Is there anything more that the park is happening? Park is it's an interesting uh, development this year. There was a decision made by the State Board of Education to uh, go to a sort of a hybrid. They call it MCAS 2.0, where they're going to incorporate some of the elements of the park test with the MCAS that served the state so well for the last. 15, 20 years. Um, so that was something that was a little bit of a departure from the direction that they were going in up to this year. But I think it's reflective of the fact that there's a new Secretary of Education, there's also new board members of the State Board of Education. And there was a feeling that the MCAS has done such 
good service to the, uh, uh, the students in the state that it should be incorporated uh, with the park. As you probably know, there's kind of an ongoing national debate about the park and the testing. Um, I think the, the new administration, in particular the new Secretary of Education, thinks that the MCAS has done um, a great deal of good for the students and we want to make sure we didn't lose the benefits. I think it's an ongoing discussion. So there were some components in the MCAS that, in, um, uh, that included parts of the park. And that's supposed to develop over the next uh, three or four years. Uh, new hires. We had uh, mentioned that we were we've been working to bring on a full-time human resources manager, and that person will be starting next week. We'll introduce her to the uh, faculty at the uh, the, st the regular staff meeting. Uh, she'll have an opportunity to start getting to know people. Uh, we've been working on that for a while. We gave the faculty an update on the progress on that at the last staff meeting. Uh, also, in response to some of the concerns that the administration noticed this year and also that were brought up by particularly some of the middle school teachers, we're looking, uh, we're interviewing for a middle school dean of students to have someone who would focus uh, on the middle school in addition to having a dean of students for the high school. We think that will help with a lot of the promotion of uh, particularly the um, life of the students outside the classroom. So what goes on in the hallways, lunch, dismissal, uh, arrival, all the sort of things that build the, that really build the culture of the school to try to develop the student character and also provide opportunities for improvements there. Uh, we have some internal candidates, some external candidates for that, so we're in the middle of that right now. An update on the regional bus registration. There's been a trend in the last several years to uh, consolidate some of the regional buses for the school. And this is because as time has gone on, there's been uh, a general decrease in the number of students that come to the school from the far, farther flung towns and an uh, increase in the number of students coming from Marlborough and the surrounding core towns in the remainder of the Hudson. We noticed this in the past, last year, uh, last summer specifically, uh, there were some combinations and eliminations of some buses because of the significant decrease in ridership. So for example, there was at one time a bus that was serving towns uh, farther to the east and southeast, as far as Newton and uh, Wellesley, Framingham, Nade. Those, those uh, the number of students on those buses has declined declined to the point where uh, that bus was no longer supportable. Uh, and then this year, uh, we've noticed that um, the ridership on the bus that's serving the northern towns, uh, Westford, Littleton, Maynard, Stowe, Hudson, has uh, increased. And the number of students on the buses coming from the west uh, has actually gone down trend has been going down for the last few years. And at this point, we're still trying to have that bus, but we've notified the parents that the cost will go up quite a bit because of the fact that there are fewer riders. We're trying to schedule that. We've gotten feedback from the parents who are interested in riding the buses to the west, riding the bus from the west, but at this point, uh, it's appreciably uh, lower than what it was last year. So it seems like the trend continues to consolidate so that there are more riders closer into the, uh, more people coming to the school from closer in, and fewer people coming from farther out. Dr. McClary, I'm just wondering, is there an opportunity for those parents who are going to incur an increase in cost if they wanted to do their own sort of separate fundraising to subsidize the bus cost? I seem to remember, I thought we did something like that some years ago where we gave the parents the opportunity to sort of offset the cost if they were able to do their creative. I, I know that last year, uh, when the parents who were being served by the buses to the east, uh, Newton and Native in that area, when they found out that the, the cost was going to go up because of the very small ridership, they got together with other parents and arranged for a, uh, a transportation uh, 
that would, uh, would help them. Mm -hmm. So I do know people do that in response to the, you know, the increased cost. Mm -hmm. But there would be that opportunity for those parents. Has there been an effort to reach out to parents that were signed up this year that didn't sign up for next year? Yeah, the, well, the, the um, <coughs> request was sent out, uh, I believe, uh, toward the uh, last week of April and was sent out to everybody that was involved in the past, and then they had a, a number of weeks to come back, and we sent reminders to them. You know, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. They have to be notified, given a date. It's, yeah. it's, you know, you need to have a plan by a certain date, otherwise the cost will be... Yeah, that's true. Well, we have to give the bus company notification by August 1st, something like that. Okay. Yeah, for planning, it's yeah. helpful to have it have the information earlier rather than later. So, you know, the, this trend is, is, is not, a, is not a, a good trend. I mean, there, you know, there's a lot of different moving parts to it, to be sure. Um, <clears throat> the school can't sustain, you know, regional bus service without having subscribers, but when the price goes up, then there are fewer subscribers. Um, you know, I realize that uh, you know, uh, in a in a legal technical sense, it's not the school's responsibility uh, or the board's responsibility to sit there and provide transportation. But you know, on some level, there is you know we do bear some uh, burden there for helping families get their kids to school. Once we've accepted them into the school, I think there's there's things that we need to do. And rather than, you know, it's all it's all fine and good for us to sort of sit there and say, okay, we've given you the opportunity to sign up for buses. You weren't able to sign up for buses. Or some of you did and others did not. And if you want to stay, you know, continue to have bus service, then we're going to, it's going to cost half again or twice as much or whatever. Um, and then just sort of, you know, say, okay, it's, it, you know, the ball is in your court. Uh, again, I understand from a rules perspective, that's what we can do. I just wonder if, uh, if we shouldn't be looking at, you know, ways of continuing to support the need to get kids to school um, through encouraging carpools. I know I've had parents over time talk to me about it's very difficult to set up carpools because you can't find out, you know, who needs a carpool, uh, you know, who lives in a particular area and things like that. So, <clears throat> you know, I guess I'd just say I, I understand why we're discussing it the way that we're discussing it in sort of very neat, logical terms of we sent this out, here's the responses we got back, the ridership has gone down, the prices are going up. I understand that. There's a part of me, though, that says, I think maybe we ought to look at other things that we might be able to do rather than just throwing all the burden on the parents to individually try to figure out how to get their kids to school. Do you distinguish between core towns and non-core towns in that? Do you think we have well, a different responsibility for core town families than we do for non-core town families? Okay, so our charter you know, as I've said before, our charter says that we support four core towns, okay? So count that three because Marlboro gets automatic bus service, okay? So we, you know, to, to some extent, we do bear a responsibility for making sure that kids from all four core towns can get to school in a reasonable way. I think, however, that we also bear some responsibility once we've taken a kid in of doing what we can I'm not saying we, we have to take every measure. I'm not saying we take on the responsibility fully ourselves. But I think we do have, once the kid is going here, we do have some responsibility to, to try to work collaboratively with parents to figure out what solutions are. It's stressful for parents, for families, for the students. Um, you know, you know, some, you know, uh, <coughs> There's a kid on, you know, so our bus comes in through Maynard. There's a kid who comes from North Andover down to Westford to pick up the bus there and ride all the way from Westford through Maynard in order to get to school here. That's pretty heroic. 
um, and they're willing, you know, she's willing to pay the, 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 the cost of doing that. But. You know, I often see people posting on the face, the AMSA Facebook page, and anybody commute from X Town, is there any way just having some kind of AMSA central sponsored online <coughs> way like, to help? Is there an app for that? There must be that to facilitate just so that we can say, hey, AMSA families, here's. During this week, there is a facility. I don't know how this works. The, this, the issue is going to, I mean, Dr. McCleary is as a front. <coughs> this issue is going to continue to, you know, the, the, you know to get worse, particularly west, um, as fewer and fewer kids are coming from that, as fewer kids use the bus, as those kids who, 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 who are coming from that, of course, are getting older and older now because they've been in the system for a while. So now they can drive. They have other options and so forth. So, again, I don't want to. There, there, we can't solve that problem right here. I'm just, I'm just offering up that I think that we need to take some steps as a, as a board, as a school, to try to figure out ways to get kids to the school and not just put the burden. Um, the board shouldn't be just putting the burden simply on the parents' shoulders. It might be worth looking at how some other charter schools that really serve a broad region do this. I mean, the college and the Parker certainly draw from a really big region. Yeah. So, like, so how would they do that? You know, we probably ought to have a task force that looks at you know, issues having to do with sort of regional, you know. <laughs> You're jumping again. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, seven years ago, when, when my oldest started, there was a bulletin board. It was sent up before I was in sixth grade. Um, so it was an answer bulletin board set up for people to test, specifically for carpools. Uh, so that did exist at one point. I think, there's, I think that's a good idea. I think there are other good ideas, and I'd like us as a board uh, to, 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 to look at, at, at those things a little long term. So does that, does that logically fit in a particular committee? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think, yes. you know, if we had a task yeah, force that was looking at regional <laughs> issues, <laughs> like, that that probably yeah. would be a good question. <laughs> so get, get back to us on that. <laughs> let me, let me yeah, give some thought to that. Give me another five minutes. <laughs> Just as a time check, we've got about one minute left. Of course, let's take okay. a lot of the report. All right, well, is there anything else on that? <clears throat> So the family serve family school relationships And this is just going to roll over into the to the brick and the deer comment also so we're sort of doing this. So this was uh, put together um, with the um, help of uh, Board members Ms. Saul and Mr. Kamal and uh, Panorama, the uh, survey, uh, professional survey organization that the school has retained to do the surveys. Um, and uh, responses came in over a period of several weeks. We got a 40, 46% response rate, um, which, which is uh, a very good response rate um, told by the people, the professional people at Panorama. And uh, as you can see, there's a summary here, the various categories in which the questions were asked, uh, family engagement, family support, grit, which is another a more, more, perhaps more trendy word for perseverance or fortitude, staying with the task, learning behavior, school climate, school fit, and school safety there at the bottom. And then the big numbers in blue tell how many favorable responses there were. Uh, but again, these, each one of these topics contains a number of questions that get at the, the big topic of family engagement, family support, or whatever, from different angles. And the way that the survey questions are put together is um, based on how they can approach these various categories and get a well-rounded sort of understanding of the relationships between the family and the school. Um, there's um, the family engagement, as you can see, uh, 16% favorable response in terms of how much families are engaged. And the questions that fall under that, if you want to see them, you just click on that, I believe, on family engagement there on the side. So this, this graph here tells you where the responses fell in terms of Panorama's other schools that they've sampled on the national level.
So that's what that green mountain is there with the red line going through it. So that tells you that based on the other, other uh, schools that were surveyed by this organization on this topic, that, that where we fall in terms of how much family engagement there is, which is, I guess, is, is helpful. So it gives you a different perspective on, on the answers. So it looks like it's awful, but not statistically unusual. Yeah, it's on the low, like what percentile? 30%. 30%. Well, so I, you know, so I'd like to understand a little bit about what it means by favorable responses, because I know when I looked at the questions, there were often, you know, out of the five responses that you had, there were four that were positive and only one that was negative. And so, you know, if we're sitting here saying on a, Likert scale of five responses, we're going to count the top four as being favorable and only the bottom one as being unfavorable, then, you know, th that, that is very different than sitting here saying that the middle one is neutral and two are negative and two are positive. Do you remember the answer to this? Because it's, yeah. Yeah. it's very similar to a question that came up in yeah, the Because I actually asked Panorama that question. They, the response was that they want to err on the side of uh, being sure that it's favorable. Because, for example, when, when we had the... the for top two. Right, the, I believe it's the top two. Yep. If you go down, uh, well, it's probably not there. But if you, you know, the, the answers, as Ken pointed out, range from, uh, you know, uh, a li little engagement, uh, somewhat engaged, you know, uh, almost no engagement, um, a great deal of engagement. And so they count only the things that are absolutely, uh, definitively positive. If it's in the middle, if it's like somewhat engaged, they'll count that as negative. And I asked them about this and they said, this is for based on their experience doing surveys, that you get the best results by doing it that way. So I have to defer to their expertise in this. They're, they're the ones that do the survey. So but it came up, for example, and again, this, this is an interesting question for me personally, because it came up when there were uh, questions on a, a mid-year check-in survey where it might have said, uh, you know, is the uh, school leader, uh, you know, doing something, say, X or Y, and it would say, well, somewhat, and that was counted as negative. So I, of course, asked them, I said, well, it's somewhat, so maybe, wouldn't that, why do you count it as negative? Is it they said, no, no, we, we err on the side of, has to be very much, or, you know, so again, I think that's the decision they made in, based on their experience. So if we acknowledge that Panorama has more experience doing school surveys, right? so, so let's throw that on the floor. All right. What I'm saying is when you have five responses and four are positive and one is negative, and when you know, you know that that skews to me the responses. Okay, I'm concerned. I'm not saying that they're wrong. I'm just saying it's worthy of exploration. So, so can't can't just think less, it's, it's not. It's not one to four. It's top two box. Or if you get two, the top two comprise positive responses. That's right. The, the bottom three, the middle and the bottom two, are not necessarily positive. Doesn't say negative, but they're not positive. So, it's, it, and which is pretty conventional. Top two boxes is considered That's positive in micro <laughs> analysis. So, so as an example, um, in the in the first question, how often do you meet in per person with teachers at your school? Which is the underlying question. The first one, or was the first underlying yeah. question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was two percent responded favorably, and that's because. Um, the top response is weekly or more, and only 1% said that. Uh, monthly, and only 1% uh, of the population responded there. And then the rest of the population either responded all, um, every few months, 7%, once or twice per year, 45%, and almost never, 47%. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So, so the first one is weekly, the second one is what, monthly? monthly. <coughs> and then the third one is what? Every few months, and every okay. few months is not included. Okay, right, right. So, so the fact that I meet with the the teacher every few months is viewed as being not positive, yeah. not being engaged. Yeah. Right. Yes. 
So that's what that's yeah. their thing. So that's why, in fact, I'm, I'm not justifying. I'm just stating the facts as as Panorama reports them. Um, so if you scroll up, I think if you, if you um, if you don't mind. Yeah, to that chart. That's why I think by the very nature of this question in this category, you tend to see this green clump is way over to the left side. Mm -hmm. For better or worse. I, I don't personally I, I yeah. You know, that that's just the way they chose to, to write it. But do, when do they when they hit their benchmark in other middle and high school <coughs> or are they elementary schools? Because I, I thought my elementary school yeah, my kids are teachers, I saw much more frequent ladder, I don't really care about that. I, I don't, I, I'm not sure. That's crazy. I, I don't know if you know that offhand. Or yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to ask yeah. him for that. So I will just reiterate, at the risk of repeating, that I'm concerned about the way that they post the information here and what they determine as being favorable for other than favorable. I think, to, to be very frank, you, you, in many of these categories, you need to look underneath to the underlying question and how the district did it to make a determination. So, I, I, I agree. It's so, do not we have the response? Do we have the responses for all of the, 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 the numbers that were responded for each of the yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, in this report, actually, uh, if you scroll down, I don't know from the PDF version it is, but um, eventually, uh, as we did last year, I think we're going to be post. I, I'm a, well, are we on this Yeah, this is what this one is. This is posted. Do you mind scrolling down? I don't know if this version has it, but if, the, uh, in the online version. The one that we got, I did not see it. Okay. Yeah, there's no breakdown like that. There's no breakdown. That's right. It may be worthwhile, um, and maybe we can chat offline if, if we can get a PDF version of that so that we can post it up rather than right. a PDF version. Yeah. I think it's also worth noting that, just because um, we happen to pause on this question, um, the favorable also relates to do parents want to see their teachers more? Like they might be happy only seeing them once or twice or every few months. You know, if our parents clamor and why can't I? On the other hand, maybe parents are like I really wish I could see my kids' teachers more. I think that that is more of an issue. Well, that's why they have other questions. Right. Yeah. They have also, that's why it's a it's a statistical thing. I understand it, but you know, really, if, 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 if we were expecting parents to be engaged by meeting weekly with the teachers, is that really the expectation that in order to be engaged? I mean, I feel sort of engaged with my parent and with my uh, uh, children's education. I can tell you, I certainly don't meet weekly or monthly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would I would say this that I think when you look at the notion of favorability, um, you you need to look at it and drill down. This is a model, and so they use the Likert model up top two box. It's, it's not, as every model is, it's imperfect. It doesn't apply properly to everything. I agree. So, so I think we have to use discretion in terms of looking at it carefully. So I would ask that when we send this, when these reports are sent out in the future, that the, the raw data get sent out as well, because I look at this and I'm not able, uh, I'm not able to interpret. Um, well, we asked for this to be circulated as soon as possible, but the the, the survey task force is going to be looking at the next layer for the next meeting mm -hmm. because there's all these open responses that need to be analyzed as well. Yeah, there's a lot of um, And so we can't send it out to everyone. I think the point being is that the, by doing this, the, the, the like of distribution, it's panorama appears to be making assumptions about what the appropriate number of contacts is. Yeah. Correct. Right? Yeah. Every few weeks, yeah. good. Every few months, not. So. I do think that the, the positive negative distinction probably isn't very meaningful yeah. on this set of questions. Well, I mean, we've, seen, we've seen that we've seen that issue with previous versions of the survey, where you know when we had the uh, what was the last one that we faculty. Did? yeah it's faculty yeah. survey. You know when we looked at the raw data and so forth, the raw data in my opinion was telling something very different. And in fact, more positive than what their analysis suggests. Yeah. So I, I'll just throw this again. They're they're using a model where they, and because it's a model, they're going to say top two box is favorable. 
this, this really shouldn't say favorable. It should say how many responded in the top two boxes. Right. You know, I mean, technically. Correct. And, and then, Correct. And then you, look, look, you look under and you see what is the top two box response. Because I would argue, in fact, you want to flip it you know, for, 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 uh, for this first question. Because if you want to see a teacher that often, it may be indicative, actually, of a very it serious may be negative issue. and not positive. Well, to, to sit there and suggest to parents that parents are engaged at a 2% level, first of all, just on the face of it, yeah. it seems yeah. absurd. But then when you look at the numbers, the numbers don't reflect that. Because if I sat there and said, I, every few months I talked to you know, one of my kids' teachers, that might be, in my mind, fully engaged, but that's not included in here. Agreed. Yeah. So, so two, I think there are two takeaways. One is, as, as was mentioned, uh, we need to do a dr deeper drill on this. Yeah. Um, as part of that, either um, with the PDF, we will have that lower level data, or as we did last year, maybe we make the link available to this, I, I think there's some hesitation on Panorama's side to make the link available, but if we go that route, we just need to extract out the open response questions, yeah. like we did last year, because we don't want to make those available to the general public, because um, they, they, they have uh, personal identifying information. But also, to be in a spirit of continuous improvement, maybe we want to try to give Panorama some of this feedback, so that maybe the next iteration some of these types of, we call them discrepancies, but certainly, you know, where there's not clear or it looks like they sort of predetermined what the baseline is, we might want to try to influence that in a way that's going to be at least more amenable to what we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should do that, but also we do need to keep in mind that one of the reasons that we wanted, this is the first time we've ever got national benchmark right. data. Yeah. 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 So the consistency yeah. and the standardization is a big reason for yeah. doing that. I would like clarification on this. Yeah. 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 What I was um, what I was surprised at, uh, you know, as I was going through this, is that, and, and then I reviewed my notes from last time when, I, I, when we sent this thing out is how little, how few of these questions refer to the administration. Most of this was the teachers in the classroom, the teachers and students in the classroom, the parents and how they felt about the teachers and the students in the classroom. But very little of this was having to do with the administration. So. I think it's important to keep in mind, though, that uh, this is founded on Panorama's research into what's important in schools. So they're looking at uh, the big picture. They're looking at the whole picture. They call it the two-way street. They say we want to see what happens in terms of how much uh, family engagement, family support there is, as well as what the school is doing. So they're trying to get that full picture. I think that's something you have to keep in mind. I guess I'm not understanding. The, uh, I'm sorry. So I'm well, I'm trying, to give you, I'm trying to give you the background. The, the, if you look at Panorama's um, uh, scholars and who they're basing this on, the, the couple of people out of the Harvard Graduate School of Education have been looking at uh, family school relationships for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And they've come up with a model, and that's where they get these sort of categories from, the school climate, school safety, environment. There's about six other ones that they have available mm -hmm. as well. And so we, meaning myself, and Rick and Liz chose the categories that we wanted, and they have other categories, mm -hmm. there's six other ones that we could have chosen. So I think, you know, for the purposes of kind of getting a benchmark, this is what we're starting with, but that doesn't mean we couldn't add other categories or to Rick's point, you know, change questions later. Mm -hmm. They're open to that. Okay. I will say um, that's, I think, part of the reason they also have open response to that, where you're not covering things folks can speak to those. I know Liz and I had an, I, I, I Dr. also had an opportunity to look at the open response. I think we need to do a little more work to kind of code those, mm -hmm. to give a better sense. Um, can you I, provide color though? Sure, I can provide a little color. This may be very limited to Liz, uh, yeah. because we, we just got the information yesterday. Um, the, the responses were very varied. I will say, I think, 
especially coming out of the last. Um, so one thing um, was, you know, the quality of the survey. How did, pe did people speak to that? There were some responses, and actually one of the very first ones was very colorful on that stuff. But overall, people didn't have very many comments on the survey. I think it was a very small percentage. So people didn't necessarily have an issue with the survey itself or the questions. Some people did. Um, one general issue that kept coming up was communication, and especially around uniforms. That was probably, I think, one of the most common topics. Um, and then there were just a series of others, but there was, uh, and I don't know if you saw any other really large trends, but I think that was probably yeah. the most interesting trend. Yeah, no, I agree. I tried to do a count on, yeah. on various things, and all the other ones seemed to be, if, if I were to quote them, would be smaller percentages, just that one really stood out. Communication, and particularly around the uniforms. It's interesting you should mention that, because I went to the PTO meeting this past week, I was this past week, I was asked to come and talk about uh, it actually the family survey, and I gave them sort of a, some of the rationale for how Panorama puts this together and how it happened. They also had a question, they, the PTO, had a question about uh, the annual giving campaign and what that's used for. But very quickly, the questions turned to the uniform. And I was, we were kind of, it was kind of humorous because I said, you know, we had a three hour meeting about the uniform that I think sometime back in the winter. And it was interesting that it came back to the new kind of yes. So we, we had some discussion. I, I don't understand. That was humorous? I, I... No, it was, it was humorous because some of the people with the PTO that were there actually had been at the meeting in February. And so when I said, you know, they had asked me to talk on three topics. Right. And so I talked to those, and then we quickly got to the new one I just mentioned. Well, I think we're back with the uniform again, primarily because the website came out and the uniforms ended up being a lot more expensive than what people were expecting to. That's at least what I've been hearing. So I don't know. I got feedback about. I got some feedback about the uniform in terms of the cost versus the durability being pretty good. But I know we're looking at a uh, possibility of having. Uh, a navy warm-up pant that would be at a lower price point, but we're trying to balance that with the quality as well and the durability. But we have responded to that concern. For some reason, there's still a whole lot of energy behind the question. Well, that's because people are having to buy the uniforms. Yeah, right? buy that's the reason why. They have to buy new uniforms, and if you got one kid, that's one thing, but if you've got two or three kids, that's a lot of uniforms to have to buy. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. Or antique was the Well, or if you have seniors who don't have younger siblings, they're buying for one year. So yeah, so I don't know you guys have complaints about that, yeah. but then most of the ones, the most of the parents who've talked to me are sitting here going, you know, you know, at the at the meeting when we saw the uniforms, you know, there was a certain price that was. You know, you know, sort of an estimate on that price that was quoted out, and now it's, you know, essentially, well, it's much more than that. Some people said double, some people said triple. The point is, is that it's a lot more expensive than what they were expecting. And so, yeah, and I, so. I would like to add that we're trying to respond to that concern by looking for a way to lower the price for. Uh, Navy warm-up pants for PE. I think it was the concern for PE uniform. And we've also um, been aware of the concern about the cost from the beginning. And so we had a, a opportunity to, I know with, with the first um, kind of comprehensive uh, document we sent out, didn't have the PE finalized, but had everything else. We said that there would be a phase-in opportunity where people would be able to use the older uniforms as long as they match the color and the cut that they will be for, for, for next year. So there has been an attempt to try to accommodate that while moving toward a, something that resembles a uniform. That's so this is not a meeting about uniforms, really, just to talk about that topic. Um, it, it, it's not that the school is in process of doing that. It's communicating about that when they're done, which is, I believe, we do. <laughs> that there will be a clarification. 
can we go back to? Yeah, so uh, uh, just as a time check, we're, yeah. we're about five minutes know. over. Yeah. So um, I think kind of as next steps, there, there'll be a deeper drill down yeah. on this. Uh, sounds like we'll, we collectively will look at getting more detailed information in the PDF format for the general public. And I know Liz and I, we can talk about offline um, coding and trying to redact some of the current comments. So that yeah, I mean, here, more, the more school detail. climate and the school fit went up down because we were at 20th percentile compared to benchmark um, for those. So we just need to understand what some of these things mean. But yes, I would appreciate your digging into it and getting a little more. This was sort of the first you know, summation. So looking forward to that. Yeah, and I think if the more that we can do, just to, per the conversation we just had here, to make it descriptive rather than you know, like this was positive, this was negative, that didn't get us very far with the first question. To say that, you know, the, the ones and twos dominated and say what those are because, you know, they, they really, <clears throat> I mean, we're saying positive and negative, but all that is is counts of parent teacher contacts. Yeah, so yeah. actually that's true. So when we're getting we're getting kind of wrapped around the axle around you know, is what's good for us and what's bad. And we're really trying to figure out what it is. Yep. So if there are specific topics um, and as you review the state, if you if anyone has specific questions, I would invite you to send them to Liz and Rick directly. Looking to it for next month. I can also send out to the board members a little more information about how they put together the survey, what sort of the intellectual rationale for it, if you're interested in reading more into that. I mean, it's up to you, I guess. I think that would be helpful. One other piece of chair business before we get to the Regional Issues Task Force. All board members, this is the time of year that we have to fill out our financial disclosure forms and, and send them to the state and to all our all the other places that we have to send them. Um, you should have gotten an email. I know I got one last week from James DeMeo. So if you've gotten those, you can do that all. OK, it's not even that you can. You have to. You have to do it online. You have to fill out that form online. Let Sarah know when you've done that, because then she can download what you've done and send it to the other places that we also have to send it. So in the effort to streamline, it's actually now twice as much work, because you have to do it electronically and do it, send it to the other places. Is this for the term that's coming up? Or the it is for ending? the term that's ending, so you are revised. Actually, anyone who's a trustee, I believe, anytime during 2016, uh, 2015. Right, so Roger, you yeah, have already filled out. Yeah. So any, anybody who's a trustee, anyone who's a trustee during, during 2000, 2000, from January 1st to December 31st, 2015, has to fill the form out. So you're going to get one next year, too. <coughs> yeah, because you'll get it for 2016. For January, yeah, as well. That's actually usually what we have to go track down in the form of trustees. You do it when you start. People yeah. have to do it as soon as they start, just because that's required for approval. I've um, then tried to do it every, every year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um,
Yeah. So Liz and I have uh, 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 made a lot of progress uh, this month. So, um, so we've had a number of discussions about sort of the path forward. Um, one of the uh, discussions that we had was around membership, and um, so you know, so first off, the membership is of the task force, and I would distinguish that from who we are going to be seeking to get information from, which is a, obviously a much broader set of folks. So the fact that they, you know, the membership will be relatively narrow, um, you know, is not meant that we're only going to be getting input from that. So when Liz and I talked about it, we, we talked about um, asking uh, for um, a representative from the administration, from the faculty, and from guidance because we felt like guidance uh, might uh, have picked up on a lot of struggles that some of the uh, students were going through. Uh, and we've uh, sent uh, that request to Dr. McCleary, and Dr. McCleary is reviewing that right now. Um, so we're hoping to get representatives from each of those, you know, again, administration guidance and faculty. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there's two board members, Liz and myself, and then we also uh, decided to reach out to uh, parents and so um, through our resources we have reached out to parents and started getting responses in it sort of looking at uh, one parent from Maynard, Hudson and Clinton and then one from a non-core town um, and so uh, and we're getting responses um, uh, from all four of those populations so um, we should have selections fairly soon. Um, we've also set, sent an initial data request to Dr. McCleary uh, for some information around uh, enrollments, um, population, um, uh, regional uh, bus service. Um, you know, we had asked for you know some information on uh, after-school activity participation, which isn't tracked, but. Perhaps we can get some anecdotal information in that. But anyway, we have submitted an initial data request to Dr. McCleary. And he's responded in part and has continued to gather information for that. Um, once uh, Liz and I talk and sort of settle on the membership, then we're going to start taking a look at sort of a, a survey, um, how we might gather information from, uh, from the various populations uh, uh, to uh, uh, to sort of get perspectives on that. So as as we've reached out to the communities, uh, again the you know Clinton, Hudson, Maynard, and out, you know beyond that, um, some people have said, hey, I can't be on the task force, but I got some perspectives I'd like to offer. Yeah. So of course we'll be able to you know, get out to that. Um, so initially there's some obvious issues um, that we would uh, be taking a look at. Regional bus service being one, uh, after school activities and participation in that would be another, and then sort of a more general one around activities uh, that uh, would help sort of build connections uh, with uh, within the, uh, the the school community. And so, you know, an example of this is you know uh, when you come in that you know your kid's a sixth grader, you come in and they're taking uh, the the test together. Uh, the placement test together, and then later on they get together uh, for a pizza party and so forth. Uh, you know, again, for some of those kids that are there, they look around, they see familiar faces because they've been going to school with these folks for a long time. Uh, in other instances, not that's not so much. So, how can we sort of capitalize on those initial activities uh, in order to you know to build that? And then there's sort of the Wachusett climb and. You know, there used to be nature's classroom, and there's you know field trips and so forth. Some of the field trips come at the end of the school year. How might we sort of, and the dances come at the end of the school year? How might we do some of those activities earlier on? So again, trying to nurture the relationships um, so that uh, kids that are coming from farther afield um, are uh, feeling uh, feeling more connected with the community. So that's uh, sort of where we are. Do you have any? Yeah, so that's where we're at.
Which document? I think it's this one down here. Yep. Lower. Yeah, that one. Uh, actually, is that that one? It's, there should be one, two. There should be two. Of them. It's no, going no, sorry. on. Top, top, oh, okay. top, 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 top.
Um, I, I wanted to highlight kind of some of the differences between my experience seeing Pat share for the prior three years and my experiences this year. So previously, um, I was part of the um, Director of Student Services Selection Committee. I was part of the Executive Director Search Committee. Um, the, the PAC's voice was, was always um, heard when it came to different processes. In this particular case, uh, we weren't told about Mr. Matthews' departure from the administration for an extended period of time. Um, we were not consulting on kind of the new structure to have special ed departments going to be run. We were consulting in the hiring process of Ms. Cashman. Previously, we had tremendous support um, from, the, from the whole district, um, including the financial presence at our meetings and um, open communication, where this year we have been told there will be no financial support. Only two out of 14 meetings that we had this year were attended by um, anybody in administration. And um, they had also at one point indicated that they wouldn't come to any meeting unless it was on a specific topic and there'd be no Q&A. Previously, we'd have a lot of input taken, or any input that was given was taken very seriously. Um, and where this time I feel like um, the input is, is invalidated and said, well, have, have each individual parent come talk to me. And the goal of us as a PAC is that we work as, as a unit. And it's not one person here, one person there. We're, we're working together. So I think that that concept needs to be accepted. And then um, I can say, uh, over the last three years, no one has ever, ever called me for help. No parent has ever called me for help. It was a very lonely job. Um, this year, about 25% at, at my guess um, have contacted me for help on, on a regular basis. Help meaning what? Um, guidance, um, not guidance department. Um, this, um, this just happened to my son. Um, is the you know corrective action discipline correct? Um, I just you know I requested an IEP or I requested a meeting you know two months ago and I still haven't had the meeting yet. Or I'm calling and nobody's calling back. Um, you know, or it's maybe um, you know my, my child has. Um, accommodations and the teachers aren't providing the accommodations. So it's basically, you know, when you look at those boxes, right, so the boxes that are helping the, the short child, you know, be able to reach the apple, it's, it's those boxes. There's, there's a break somewhere in those boxes. Right. So do you quantify those responses or categorize them? Because it makes a difference. Exclusionary discipline is one thing, failure to call I, back is another thing. I can't thing. do that for you. If, if you want, I can certainly put that Accommodation is a third thing. Mm -hmm. And you'll see, um, actually, I'll get to kind of one of the last slides. I actually did put together a survey uh, for all the special ed parents. So there's approximately 40 special ed children within AMSA. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was 26 of those parents responded to the survey. So about 65% responded to it. Um, and there is a bunch of detail, which may be, did you get that into their folders? The, um, the survey results or is it just up there? It's up. Okay. Um, so we can pull it up if you want. Um, and in that it has very obviously a lot of quantifiable data that, that you can look at. Alright, why don't we um, move on. So basically um, I, I broke down the different concerns that we had into three different buckets. Vision, programs, and process. Can move on. So from a vision standpoint, um, if we look at leadership, um, and, I'm, and I'm not talking about the, the people specifically, the director of student services or the special ed coordinator, the entire structure of special ed department was changed. So previously, the director of student services reported directly to the executive director, was at the same level as the principal. It had a certain weight to the role and to his guidance. Um, we are now, the special education coordinator reports to the principal. So, so we have a, a difference in, <coughs> I don't know, the, the strength of the role, the voice of the role. Um, so that was, that's just a change in that structure. 
Um, we also, I'm not going to necessarily read through each one of these, um, but we also have a, a, a concern about this consultant um, that, that is on board. Now, I think Ms. Houston is a wonderful person. Again, it's not a personal attack against Ms. Houston. Um, but I do question, what is her role? Every time that we push to say, why do we have a consultant? What is her role? What is her job description? It, it, we're not getting the, an answer. It's just, she's a consultant. And then there's, there's a perception, at least, that, that the parents have, um, that this consultant is needed, required, for the school to properly fulfill its special ed obligations. So if she is required to fulfill our role of special ed, or to, to, to fulfill it properly, then it's almost like she's acting like a director of special education. But she's not the director of special education. And we are, we are as parents, we are our recourse if something is, is going on. She's kind of like outside of what's happening within special ed. Um, and, and I feel like we need to have somebody on staff that has her caliber of experience, but I think it needs to be part of our staff, not just an external consultant. And then um, one other area that, that is particularly concerning is, is kind of the approach. Previously, um, it was always, we, we almost started the two meetings you know, okay, what do we need to do to help the child succeed? So just passing was never, an ex not, not that it wasn't acceptable, but that was not the bar. It was, okay, what can we do so we can set them up to get an A, as opposed to what do we have to do so that he doesn't fail? So it, it, it's a very different men mentality. And I feel like this year we've kind of swung to that minimum. What's the minimum that we need to provide to this kid? so that he doesn't fail. Any questions? Um, all right, next. So programs. So there are a number of different words on here that you may or may not be familiar with. Social pragmatics, that's how people talk with each other. Reading specialists, appropriately licensed teachers. There are two particular ones that um, that I, that I do want to raise. One is regarding transition planning. So transition planning um, is the method where the school, the parents, the child work together to develop a plan for what is the child going to do after high school? Are they going to go to college? Are they going to get a job? Are they going to live by themselves? And you know, for the most part, the kids that come here do not have robust needs. Some of them are you know, more than others. Um, but the children still need to be able to, you know, are they going to, do they need to drive a car? Do they need to learn proper study habits? You know, can they, I don't know, be responsible enough to do their laundry? So, and not all the stuff is required for the school to necessarily teach them, but the school, the, the parents, and the child are supposed to work together to come up with a plan for how are we going to get this student ready to be independent and productive member of society. And this isn't necessarily new, because I would say that this has been a problem over the last several years as well. But I, I think that we need to do some, some programming, training, whatever you want to call it, regarding this transition planning. And then lastly, um, the one that I want to point out are the social emotional needs. So over the last several years, the school has been making a concerted effort to address the emotional needs of all children not just special ed. Um, we had activity periods, we had speakers coming in talking about you know, bullying prevention or stress management or anxiety. And I haven't seen that going on. And, and my understanding um, is that the school is becoming completely academic focused and kind of um, not paying attention to these soft skills. And I think that that is um, short-sighted. The not addressing the social needs or the social emotional needs of children is really just going to increase our special ed needs because as these children, as they're um, as they're not able to manage some of these skills that they are lacking, um, it's going to end up in special education because they're going to be in such a mental state that.
that now we're going to have to start providing counseling services within the school system. We're going to have to, it, it, it's, you know, we're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, so I think that, that that is an area that will affect all children or affects all children, but particularly in the special needs um, area. And then process. So process, um, this is kind of where we kind of put in um, some of the compliance issues that we were talking about um, before. So time frames. Um, in the special ed law, there are required time frames for certain activities to happen. They have to happen within those time frames. There's no gray area. It's not like, oh, you have five days, but if you're up six, sorry. You know, th these things need to happen within a certain time frame. And it keeps these different processes from going on forever and ever and gets the children, and it gets to a point of where decisions get made. Um, so that if the child needs help. Time frame of what? I'm not really sure what that means. Time frame of what? So um, if I submit a request to the school saying, I believe my child has um, needs special education, I would like you to test my child. Okay. The school has five days to give me a consent form or say, no, we're not going to consent. You're going to go to BSA, uh, BSEA. Then from that point, as soon as that document is turned in, you have 45 days to do your testing and convene a team meeting. Okay, thank you. You know, so there's, there's these different time frames that, that must be followed. And we've had a lot of challenges with that this year. Uh, goals and benchmarks um, are tools that we use to determine if a child is making effective progress. So this is like any report you write for your business, what are my sales targets, Am I meeting them? Do I need to adjust? So that same concept is built within the IEP process. And um, this year, there, there's been some challenges with getting measurements on our progress reports. So um, subjective words, like so-and-so is doing really well. So-and-so is very happy. That, that's not a measurement. You can't judge that somebody making progress or not making progress. Or the right things to the wrong things. So were there tools being used in prior years that are not being used now? Um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily tools, so but when you when you write your IEPs, you say, um, you know, for example, um, Ryan will, um, during conversation, Ryan will have three exchanges before he changes the topic. Right, so that's, okay, he's, so he's learning how to make conversation. So if you're just saying, Brian is communicating really well. Got it. Thank you. What's he doing? So it, it, it's all in the wording. How, how got things it, go? I got it. Well, it's in the wording. It's also in the mindset in terms of how, you know, if you're taking a look, if there's a certain intervention, is that intervention being successful exactly. or is not being successful? Mm -hmm. Are you ready to move on to a, another? Um, right. Uh, Different another, strategy. Right. Another yep. strategy. Thank you. Exactly. Um, so then communication. Um, previously, um, and I don't know, um, Ms. Bone maybe can tell me if this is still true. I know when we first started here, um, the special ed liaisons would have grade level meetings for every student that was on an IEP. I believe it was every three weeks. So every three weeks, the special ed liaison would get together with the teachers, say, hey, everything going okay with Ryan? Anything I need to know about? And then that would get reported back to the parents. So there would be a lot of proactive communication to the parents, letting us know what was going on. The good, the bad, the ugly. This year, that type of proactive communication doesn't happen. It doesn't happen on a regular basis. 